Hi, I'm Juan Ha, and this is The Big Take from Bloomberg. We've got something special for you today. This Saturday, Taiwanese are heading to the polls to elect a new president. And perhaps no issue weighs more heavily on the mind of voters than the escalating tensions with China. Conflict with its mighty neighbor just across the waters is a constant that Taiwanese have lived with for decades. China sees Taiwan as a breakaway province. In 1949, China's communists defeated the Nationalist Party in a civil war and took over the mainland. That defeated army fled to Taiwan to establish its own government there, which China refuses to acknowledge and has threatened to take back the island by force if necessary. For the people of Taiwan, that danger has felt more real since August 2022. That's when a surprise visit by U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to the island prompted China to launch unprecedented military drills. And on top of those growing internal fears, Taiwanese are also paying close attention to a global battle outside the region, a battle that feels too similar to their own worst nightmare. Russia's invasion of Ukraine. As Vladimir Putin sends in waves of new troops, the struggle to fight back against a more powerful enemy has hit close to home for many Taiwanese. So close that a few of them have even decided to join Ukraine's fight. Today, our reporter Yang Yang brings us a story of one of them. A young Taiwanese soldier, Zhen Shang Guang, or Jonathan Sun, who volunteered to fight for Ukraine. Here's Young with Jonathan's story. On a Saturday afternoon last June, Jonathan Tam prepares to board a flight at Taiwan Taoyuan International Airport. This will be the start of his journey to the war in Ukraine. Jonathan is snacking on some Taiwanese popcorn chicken in the food court of Terminal 1. He's 24 years old, 5 feet 8, in a navy blue shirt and a fresh flat top. Baby-faced, but well-built. His wife, who asked that we call her Gina, sits quietly by him. Eyes red and puffy. Jonathan calls his mom. Ma... I'm taking the flight tonight to Ukraine, he says. And she starts crying on the phone, too. Then crying becomes begging, begging becomes yelling, and yelling becomes crying again. Jonathan tries to comfort her. Don't worry, he tries to laugh it off. I'll be back soon. Jonathan's got two bags beside him. One big and one small. In them, he's got everything he expects to need for the next couple of months. A bulletproof vest, two bulletproof boards, a helmet, muscle pain relievers, and a ton of Taiwanese instant noodles. He did his homework before packing these bags. He talked to multiple people who knew about the situation on the ground in Ukraine from tactical gear suppliers to other volunteer soldiers. All of them warned him about the risks. They told him the logistics in Ukraine were garbage at that time. The country had such a shortage of equipment that soldiers were sharing things like helmets on the battlefield. Hearing these kinds of stories scared Gina. She did not want Jonathan to go, but she knows her husband. He's as stubborn as a mule. She told me if she overreacted or tried to talk him out of it, he would disappear and do it anyway. If I try to stop him, it's very likely that I would never see him again. And I would find out that he's made it into Ukraine when he's dead. Upstairs in the airport hallway, a group of people are waiting to send Jonathan off. 
He's got some friends there, but also some people he's just met. Some of them are Ukrainians living in Taiwan who heard that Jonathan was going to join the fight and want to see him off. These Ukrainians have worked with local Taiwanese people to raise money to donate supplies and equipment to Ukraine. Some of the money they raised paid for Jonathan's gear. At one point, Jonathan and some members of the Ukrainian community all stand in a line for a picture. They hold two flags in front of them, one for Taiwan, one for Ukraine. Nobody smiles in the picture. Jonathan's wife Gina says the journey to this moment of him heading off to the war started back in February 2022, just one day after Russia invaded. He has a habit of watching videos before going to sleep. You know, that was his pre-bedtime routine. And almost everything he watched at that time was about the war. Gina told me there was one video that really got to him. In the video, a Russian warplane was firing on a village near Kyiv. It was filmed from a civilian's house. The plane fired two shots. One of them broke through the window. A small child started screaming. A woman rushed them downstairs to the basement. There was a moment when he saw a kid getting bombed. That kid was of the same age as his son. Jonathan has a son from a previous relationship. He said to me, I don't know what I'm going to do if my kid was bombed like this. This idea that his own son could be bombed at home, it wasn't coming out of nowhere for Jonathan. For decades, China has been threatening Taiwan with the prospect of an invasion. And lately, China's military has been ramping up aggressive activities across the Taiwan Strait. So when the war broke out in Ukraine, it was easy for Jonathan to see himself in the face of the people who were under attack. Now, of course, lots of other people saw this video too and didn't decide to go to Ukraine and enlist. But Jonathan was young and a little lost. And his wife said for much of his life, he felt disempowered, like he didn't have a say in what happened to him. But making the choice to go to Ukraine, that was something he was in control of. Jonathan's plan was to fly to Poland and then travel to Ukraine by car from the border. Once in Ukraine, he would go to the Foreign Legion. A week after he left Taiwan on that flight, Jonathan updated his Facebook profile picture. In it, he was standing in what looks like a dormitory, holding a rifle in a full military camouflage uniform. In the comments, his friends back home did not shy away from pointing out his beer belly and far-stretched shirt. Did you get two sizes too small? Somebody asked. He replied politely. I ate too well. I'm sure I'll lose weight soon. He was right about that. Once Jonathan got to Ukraine, he went to a base of the Ukraine Foreign Legion. It's usually the first stop for foreigners who want to fight for the country. It was there that he made one of his first friends in Ukraine, a young American soldier from Ohio who goes by Shaggy. Hello, my name is Shaggy. I am a volunteer fighter in Ukraine. Shaggy said he and Jonathan both showed up at the center and basically said, hello, I want to fight. And then they answered a bunch of questions. You give him any military documents you have. You have to do like medical checks. And then you'll have to like do an interview where they find out your military experience. And then they make a file for you and then they send you to whatever unit they want to send you. Shaggy told me he and Jonathan watched a lot of people come and go at the Legion. Many didn't stick around. 
so a lot of people came, I guess, with like big dreams of being some sort of action hero. They hadn't had any military training, uh, didn't have any military experience. They just didn't process what exactly they were getting themselves into. But that wasn't the case with him and Jonathan. Before Ukraine, Shaggy served in the U.S. Army for three years, and Jonathan was in the Taiwanese Army for nearly five years. In a Facebook post, Jonathan seemed proud that he stayed on. We don't take trash here. We take people who are not scared to die, who dare to charge. So if you want to come, come fast. We already kicked four people out yesterday. We desperately need more right now. And to people who met Jonathan early in his time in Ukraine, he looked comfortable there, an eager soldier in a growing conflict. I think he was really built to be a soldier. Safran Shikaze is a war photographer who was embedded in the same unit as Jonathan for a while. You could tell that, especially when he was wearing full kit. Yeah. Well, you know, some other soldiers, to be completely honest, when they're wearing full kit, uh, you start wondering, like, hey, who who do you borrow that from? <laughs> you know, <laughs> did you borrow that from? Did you take that from somebody? Like, <laughs> they 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 seem like they're out of their element. Um, but Jonathan Tsang was was definitely in his element uh, when he wore his kit. It's just his second skin. Yeah, second skin. Yeah, that's a good good way to put it. So Jonathan was all dressed and ready to play his part. But things got off to a slow start. It had been a month since he arrived in Ukraine, and he hadn't gone on a single mission yet. Life at the Foreign Legion turned out to be just about training every day. Here's Shaggy again. We just do military drills every day. Just wake up, do exercise, come back, eat breakfast, train until lunch, do some more training until... Uh, later, and then have the rest of the day off. That was pretty much uh, about every day. The training was helpful at first, but Shaggy said it soon got old. He and Jonathan kept hoping to get assigned to a mission, but instead, they were sent to the training ground. Jonathan posted a selfie, eyes dull, face covered, captioned, Wait, wait, wait. After nearly two months, Shaggy and Jonathan decided, that's it. They were done waiting. So me, Jonathan, and these two other guys, we left and we went to a unit that was actively fighting. The unit that they left for is the 49th Battalion. I was able to reach one of the other guys who went with them. I'll just go by Ron. Jonathan met Shaggy and Ron in the Foreign Legion. They spent their time there waiting around, but also sizing people up. And they found each other reliable. That's why I left with the three others, because I knew how they would fight compared to if I just stayed there. Because the team that in the Legion that I was left with were all brand new. And uh, I didn't know how they would react or do anything when uh, we got into any conflicts. Just like that. They made a pact. Going forward, they would move as a group and back each other up. But before Jonathan joined the new unit, some news drew his attention back home to Taiwan. At the beginning of August 2022, U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi made a surprise, unprecedented visit to Taiwan, which sparked fury from China. China sees Taiwan as part of its territory and opposes any official interaction with Taiwan from foreign governments. And this morning, Chinese officials warned against the, quote, egregious political impact of a trip to the self-governing island. With House Speaker Nancy Pelosi meeting with Taiwan's president overnight, China is accusing the U.S. of playing with fire. In response to Pelosi's trip, Beijing announced military exercises in the waters surrounding Taiwan including conducting live ammunition drills and firing missiles directly over the island. The Pentagon is working around the clock, monitoring any Chinese movements in the region and securing a plan to keep Pelosi and the congressional delegation she's leading safe. Taiwan at the time was debating extending its compulsory military service from four months to one year, and Jonathan supported it. 
He wrote on Facebook. Just straight up extended. Where do all these questions come from? Then he asked himself, "Should I go back?" After all, it was his fear for his home that had brought him to Ukraine in the first place. He talked to the war photographer Saffron about it. So, so yeah. Jonathan, yeah, wh- why are you out here uh, fighting, fighting for Ukraine? Um, why am I here? This is a video taped by Saffron when he first met Jonathan. This very evening, Saffron was able to grab Jonathan for a quick interview as he came up the hill from training. The sun set behind him. His face was a bit blurry from the halo. First of all, where are you from, man? I'm from Taiwan. Yeah, from see? Taiwan. This one. Here. Awesome. Jonathan tapped a patch on his chest, a half Ukrainian, half Taiwanese flag. I'm here just because I need to get some experience, you know, some real f-ing man experience. <laughs> and yeah, so I can get more experience, get back to Taiwan, and yeah. Help my country, defend uh-huh. my country, but I need to f-ing help this country first. You know? I see, I see. Yeah. And why do you want that experience? What's what's happening in Taiwan, man? Well, China wants wanted to f-ing invade Taiwan, so yeah. So you're trying to I'm prepare here. yourself. Yeah. I see, I see. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Back at the military base, Jonathan posted a photo. It was just his bed. On one side of it, a giant Taiwanese flag was on the wall, captioned "Hold on." And in an Instagram post, he wrote, "As for when I'm going back, I'm not sure. Anyway, I won't go back until I finish the fight." Jonathan and his new friends Shaggy and Ron had left the Foreign Legion in late August. And landed at the Carpathian Siege 49th Infantry Battalion, commonly known as the Siege in Ukraine. At that time, they were stationed at Izium, a city in eastern Ukraine that holds outsized military importance. One day, the Russians attacked the base where Jonathan and the others were staying. It was a terrifying attack. Saffron was there when it happened. That's when they they sent tanks、uh, rolling、uh, over the hills and、uh, close to our base, and that's when the tanks started firing on on the base.、Um, that was a very scary moment for for many of the soldiers there, and they talk about that moment a lot. Jonathan and Ron were away at the time. They left to sign some paperwork in order to keep fighting for Ukraine, but while they were gone. The house they stayed at was hit. Some artillery landed a meter from where they'd been sleeping. Essentially, the shelter I had was immediately、uh, demolished, and everything inside that I left there was just tra- like shredded. So you could have been killed, basically. Yeah. But Jonathan's fellow soldiers were standing ground. It was around this time that Ukraine made a huge advance and pushed the Russian forces into a stunning retreat. The whole front line on the Russian side had collapsed in eastern Ukraine. Izium, where Jonathan's battalion was stationed, was abandoned by the Russians in haste. While waiting for orders on what to do next, Jonathan hung with the boys and regretted not bringing Lego or video games to kill time. Instead, he watched a lot of TikTok videos and practiced his dance moves. Ron told me. He would drop everything and dance to this song every time he heard it. Jonathan's friends say he was unexpectedly funny, and it drew people to him. Yeah, it was it was fun being with him. Gina says Jonathan had nicknames for those he bonded with, and shared everything with her on FaceTime. She thinks. This was perhaps the happiest time in Jonathan's life. He would tell me about everything and everybody around him, always with a smile. I was happy to see him smiling more during this time than when he was in Taiwan. It did not last.
Jonathan's journey in Ukraine takes a dark turn after the break. After Russia retreated in September 2022, Ukraine immediately started looking for the next front line to push forward. Jonathan's battalion closed in on the Russians gradually, claiming areas where they used to be. And amidst the fun that Jonathan seemed to be having with his friends, a new type of vulnerability seemed to poke through in his posts online. For the first time, Jonathan started to openly acknowledge the very real danger he was in. It came through in a conversation he had with a stranger. As the war progressed, volunteering soldiers like Jonathan started to get more attention from the media. Jonathan's profile is set public, and it's not hard to find him online given his outspoken posts. But not everyone who came to his page admired him for going to Ukraine. People called him a coward, a poser, a Taiwan separatist. And one online interaction in particular took a darker turn. He posted a screenshot of the chat on his Facebook page. So you're in the Ukrainian army? Yes. How long have you been there? Four months. How are you treated there? What's the casualty rate? You don't even know how you're going to die, let alone treatment. Well, you're not dead yet, are you? These words on their own might not sound that hurtful. But in Chinese culture, you don't go about and ask people whether they're dead or not. It can feel like a curse. Jonathan left a caption on the screenshot of the chat. You're not dead yet, are you? To be frank... I don't know if I get to be that lucky every time. In the middle of many nights, it was the sound of bombing that woke me up. And I'm scared. You never know if it'll hit your house next time. Throughout his entire time in Ukraine, Jonathan was warned by everyone about the risks he was taking. Gina told me he really believed that he'd come home with honor. Jonathan didn't even say goodbye to his son. He didn't see the need to. But here he is, in the middle of the night, just about 30 kilometers from the enemy's base. It seems like he started to feel a target creeping on his back. A few days later, he posted this video. You only see a naked light bulb on the ceiling. Jonathan probably filmed this lying on his bed. In the background, you can hear the shooting sound, landing close to where he was. He captioned the post. If you got too many bullets, you can share them with me. In late October, Jonathan's battalion had a new mission. To chase the Russians even further away. They were set out in two days. The first group will be in charge of pushing the front line and attacking the enemy with armored vehicles. The second group, where Jonathan was, would defend the front line right behind the first group, guarding trenches, shooting mortars, making sure no opposition came their way. The mission, as the soldiers were told, was supposed to be just about five days, and the plan was to move forward all the time as the first group gained more ground. This is absolutely not what happened next. Instead of moving forward every day, the groups made progress only on the first day. We don't know what, but something stopped the first group from pushing the front line further, and things pretty much stopped on day two. Jonathan's group was defending the line rather than advancing. We got this video from Jonathan's wife, Gina. She shared some videos with us that Jonathan never shared publicly. In this video, it was raining relentlessly and everything was turned into mud. Jonathan was walking in the rain, pacing around, picking up trash left behind by the Russians. This hilltop he was at 
used to be occupied by the enemy just days ago. You can hear the bombing occasionally in the background. Now, both sides were locked in a stalemate. Jonathan's group was stationed on one hilltop, the Russians on the other. They were just about one kilometer away from each other, separated by a valley in between. I talked to Shaggy about it. Every day we would uh, get shelled um, periodically throughout the day, sometimes with grad rockets, sometimes with tank fire, sometimes with mortars, artillery, um, just various weapons that they would use. The Russians used heavy artillery. They fired whatever they had on hand, and the Ukrainians fired back. The ring went on for days, and the mission had gone twice as long as it was supposed to be. People started complaining. Some got sick and asked to leave early. Jonathan was constantly drenched. So was his sleeping bag. But he wasn't going to leave. On the eighth day of the mission, Jonathan was ordered to move bunkers. Someone a hundred meters south got sick and left early. He stepped in to fill the spot. The bombing sounded worse there, at least from the look of Jonathan's videos. Fucking hell, he said. In the video, you can see Jonathan flinch and curl up in a bunker. Ron told me there's nothing you can do when militaries are just firing artillery at each other. All you can do is to lie low in the bunker and wait for it to pass. You can tell if a cannon is getting close to you by the sound of it, and you just pray that it doesn't land on you. One night, it got too close. You guys think I'm having fun here? Let me show you what fun I've been having. Does this look like fun to you? A piece of shrapnel hit just about six meters away from Jonathan. The shell cut through his vest and dented his helmet. He filmed a video showing his damaged gear, cursing at the Russians. They just broke my helmet. F*** you. Ah, it's straight up dented. F*** I'm so pissed. The shell didn't just dent Jonathan's helmet. It also left him with a concussion. A truck was supposed to pick up the injured from the field every day. And the next day, Jonathan should have been on it. But the road was so muddy that the truck didn't come the next morning. That following afternoon, as usual, Russia fired another tank round. Luck was not with Jonathan this time. I remember I was sitting at the commander's table. It's like this small kitchen table. And I was drinking a coffee. And there's a radio charging area, like a counter where they put all the radios and charge them. And they just let them sit there. Uh, they keep them on. And you can hear uh, different radio chatter coming in. And all of a sudden, we hear evacuatri, evacuatri, which means evacuation. Uh, they are re requesting evacuation. I'm pretty good at identifying people's voices. So immediately, I knew it was third company's commander's voice. And you could also tell that there was a very, um, there was a lot of distress in his voice, um, so much so that I thought he was injured. Yeah, a few moments later, uh, as the press officer is listening in um, and getting more information, uh, we realized that one of the guys is Jonathan. One of the guys is Zhang. Um, yeah. But Jonathan wasn't injured. He was dead. Yeah, I mean, you can... You definitely feel like there's something that drops inside of your stomach. Um, yeah, your gut feels heavy. 
and you don't know what to do. Um, you want to do something, but there's nothing that you can do. You know, it's kind of like uh, being late to work and you're on the train and you just wish that you could run. Maybe you could run and get there faster, but you're on a train. There's nothing you could do. You just have to sit there and wait. And it kind of felt like that, you know. The news about Jonathan also made its way to Ron. I was just angry that that he went down there instead of um, stayed here with me, stayed in that position. Because he just went down there like the day before. So I just punched a tree a couple of times and then, I mean, I can't really do anything. We're still there and we're still taking artillery. Two days later, over 8,000 miles away, the news reached Gina. It was, of course, the thing she had feared the most since that Saturday back in June 2022, when she watched him get on that plane. I feel like I want to blame him. Why didn't you take care of yourself? Why didn't you go to the doctor after you got hit? And I want to blame myself. Why couldn't I help? Jonathan's been gone for over a year now, and the war in Ukraine continues on with no end in sight. According to U.S. officials, about half a million soldiers from both sides have been killed or injured there since the war began. And back in Taiwan, the fear over a potential Chinese attack still hangs heavy in the air. Although analysts say it's unlikely anytime soon. At the new home in Taipei, where Gina now lives, signs of Jonathan are everywhere. A giant flag of Jonathan's battalion, the Siege, hangs above her bed. His photos and badges are at her bedside. The day she spoke to us, we joined her for lunch, and when it came to divvy up the portions, she put some rice out for Jonathan at his shrine next to her bed. He's just here with you, I said. I know, she replied. That's Yang Yang from Bloomberg. If you want to see photos of Jonathan Sung's journey, visit Bloomberg.com. You can also read Young's account of reporting the story there. This episode was produced by Yang Yang. She and Wan Qianhua reported the story. Our editor is Caitlin Kenny, along with Emma O'Brien and Dan Tenkate. Sound design, mixing, and engineering was by Yang Yang and Alexander Sugiura. Sage Bauman is the head of Bloomberg Podcast. And a big thanks to our colleagues for their help in making this episode, including Samson Ellis, Alice Huang, and Katria Alampe. Join us next week for another episode from Taiwan. We'll hear how locals are preparing for the prospect of a Chinese invasion. See you 